if you have your Bible before you, you would find it helpful to have it open at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and at the passage which we read together. Anyone who reads through the New Testament Gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry with any degree of care would quickly discover that there are certain points of the narrative that stand out almost like mountains on the terrain as occasions of peculiar importance for an understanding of Jesus' ministry and of the development of everything that he came to do in the world. Some of these are very obvious. Some of them indeed are physical mountains as well as metaphorical mountains. But this passage that we read this morning at Caesarea Philippi when Jesus is gathered together with his disciples is unquestionably one of these crucially important parts of the gospel record. One New Testament writer says it would be impossible to exaggerate its importance. And for us this morning, its importance really lies in the fact that it is a call to clarity. Jesus has been teaching his disciples and the wider multitude for some considerable time in areas like the Sermon on the Mount or through parables or through the miracles when he has calmed the storm and fed the 5,000 and so on. And now he brings them to the place where he is gathering them together to confront them with the need for clarity in certain areas of their thinking and of their relationship with him. These areas are very obvious if you look through the passage that we read this morning. They are, first of all, clarity about Jesus himself when he confronts them, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Secondly, clarity about his death and the whole purpose of his mission. In verses 21 to 23, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, and so on, and must be killed, and on the third day rise again. And he is eager that they should find clarity about his death. And whereas Simon Peter had found clarity about his person, he had certainly not found clarity about Jesus' death. And as on the, in the one breath he said to him, You are blessed, Simon, because you have discovered from my Father who I am. On the other he turns to him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You savor not of the things of God, but of the things of men. So Jesus is urging clarity about his person, who he is about his death on the cross and his resurrection, why he has come into the world. And finally, in verses 24 to 28, he is calling for clarity about what it means to be one of his followers and what they are to be like. Then Jesus said to his disciples, verse 24, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now we greatly need the kind of clarity that Jesus was seeking from the twelve at this particular time in our own lives. It is simply true, you see, a matter of fact, that you cannot get very near to Jesus Christ without discovering him calling for this clarity about himself and who he is, about his death on the cross and why he came, and about exactly what it means to be one of his followers. And I want us, in the next three Sunday mornings when I shall be preaching, to think about these three areas in which our Lord Jesus calls for this clarity. 
First, regarding his person. Secondly, regarding what he has come to do. And thirdly, regarding what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Let me take you through the first of these this morning by focusing on the four things that Matthew appears to emphasize when he describes to us Jesus' challenge to clarity in the whole realm of who he is, their perception of his person. Matthew focuses on four things. First, the place where this challenge was issued, Caesarea Philippi. Secondly, the question Jesus asked. Thirdly, the confession that Peter gave in response. And fourthly, the response of Jesus to that. And I want to think with you about these four things this morning. The place is not in any sense insignificant. In fact, it's full of interest and of importance. Caesarea Philippi was probably 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. It was a place with a fascinating history. Caesarea Philippi was the name that Philip, the Herod or ruler of the area, gave to it in order to please and ingratiate himself with the emperor. And he called it Caesarea Philippi, partly to ingratiate himself with the emperor and partly to leave a mark with his own name in the world in which he lived and to differentiate it from the Caesarea which was down nearer the coast. Caesarea, therefore, in that time, boasted a great white marble temple which had been built in honor of Caesar. It was a place of Caesar worship, where they worshipped the national leader, where they honored the glories of man. And Caesar's temple in Caesarea Philippi was a dominant feature of the town. But it hadn't always been called Caesarea Philippi. It was originally called Panias. And it was called so after the name of the god Pan, who also had a temple at that place. Pan was the god of nature, the god of fertility, the god who gathered together in himself so many elements in the paganism of these times. And still there was a shrine to Pan at this period. The most modern name of the place is Banias in Syria, which carries still the name of Pan to which it's reverted. Now the significance of all that is obvious to you, I'm sure. Here in the midst of this place, which was a testimony to the gathering together of many kinds of religion, of different traditions of paganism and nature worship and Caesar worship, here in this place, Jesus gathers his disciples together in the midst of all the relativism of that world to stand as the absolute Lord of Lords and King of Kings and challenge them as to who they thought he was, what they made of Jesus, how they related to him. It's a very significant thing, isn't it, that in our modern society we often imagine that our modern multi-faith social situation is a new phenomenon and that claims to the exclusiveness of Jesus Christ as the only way to God are therefore somewhat out of place in this extraordinarily complex relativistic subjective society in which we live where syncretism, the gathering together of many religions seems more appropriate than the insistence on the uniqueness of Jesus. But you know, our present society is not a novel phenomenon of the 20th century in its latter years. 
It was precisely into that kind of society that Jesus Christ came and challenged these men and said, what do you make of me? What do you say of me? Who do you think I am? Have you confronted yourself with the claims that I have brought before you? How do you perceive me? And Jesus still brings that question to us in the world in which we live today, where the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as the only Son of the living God and the only mediator between God and men has never been more desperately needed. So the place has great importance because it has shadows that cast themselves forward to our own day. The question is also of great importance, and Matthew focuses on that for us now. There are really two questions. Did you notice the first is a question about public opinion? When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi in verse 13, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? What is the popular conception of Jesus? Now the answer was one that expressed the vagueness with which people thought about Jesus. Well, they said, some say you are John the Baptist, some say you are Elijah, some say you are Jeremiah, and of course there was a measure of truth in all that. There was a similarity between the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of John. Elijah was someone who was the great prophet of God, who revealed God to men as Jesus came to do. And there is much about the ministry of Jeremiah that could be a reflection of the ministry of Jesus. But you see the important thing? It was vagueness that characterized this popular opinion about Jesus. And that's precisely the characteristic of so much thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ in our contemporary world. I may say to you, my dear friends, in our contemporary church, vagueness about the Lord Jesus Christ, about His person, about who He is, about His utter uniqueness in the universe. I had a remarkable example of that some years ago when I was in uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And one morning I had just been speaking to a number of Muslim students a few days before. I had been talking with many different people from different religious backgrounds, and we were speaking about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. It was the stumbling block to them. And then I picked up the paper. Some of you from Malaysia will know whether it's the right title. I think it's called The Straits Times. Is that right? Yes, they say. It's The Straits Times. You can take it from the authorities. And I opened this English language newspaper. There had been a book published in England that week entitled The Myth of God Incarnate. And across the middle of the front page, there was the legend, Jesus Christ, not God, say Christian teachers. And the vagueness, you see, permeates from these academic heights through the whole of society. And the Lord Jesus Christ challenges that vagueness and says, who do you say that I am? And he brings it down to this personal level they say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. They are varying opinions. And he says, now what about you? Who do you say that I am? And that leads us to the third focus that Matthew has. And that is the confession 
that he makes. But will you notice before he does that when Jesus Christ begins to have any kind of relationship with us, what he does is gradually to bring us into a corner, as it were, so that he challenges us to come out of the realm of vagueness in our thinking about himself. And you will notice the nature of the question. The question is not, what do you think about religion? Or what do you think about religious living and moral standards? Or even, what do you think about my followers, the church? But what do you think about me? That's the question. And I know so many people, I find them here in Glasgow by the score, who run away from this central challenge of Jesus Christ into these various subsidiary questions. Because somehow or other, they are afraid to face the central challenge. Have you really made up your mind about Jesus Christ? What perception do you have of him? Is he just a great teacher amongst many? Well then, I say to you, the claims that the Lord Jesus Christ made make him no great teacher. They make him a madman. Or at the very least, an egotist of an extraordinary dimension. And then together with that, have you faced the challenge of his utter humility and self-sacrifice? It is not the stuff of which megalomaniacs are made, you see, that they will offer themselves sacrificially for others, live a life of service for other people. I say to you, my dear friends, have you really come to terms with the challenge of who Jesus Christ is? Well, here is Peter's confession. It's not so much a confession in the sense in which we use the word today. It's an exclamation of a conviction which had struck Peter like an arrow. Who do you say I am? And in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And from somewhere deep within him, Peter found this exclamation coming pouring out from his inmost being. I know who you are, he says. You are Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. You know the word, don't you? It's the word that you find in the Old Testament for one who was anointed. Now, there were three categories of people in the Old Testament who were, generally speaking, anointed with oil for their ministry. One was a prophet, less commonly. The second was a priest, very commonly, who was anointed for his task. The third was a king, universally. And when the king was to be crowned, and it still happens in the coronation service here in Britain, oil anoints the head of the monarch, and the anointed one carried together these three functions now constantly. The people of God were being taught through the Old Testament to look for a Messiah, an anointed one who would come and fulfill all these functions in perfect glory. He would be the prophet who would declare with absolute authority God's word and God's will to men. He would be the priest who would not just offer an imperfect sacrifice annually, but offer himself to God as the one full final sacrifice for the sins of all. And he would be the anointed king who would come to be Lord over all creation one day. The Messiah, the Anointed One, that's who you are, says Peter. 
And then he says, and you are none other than the Son of the living God. The one who is the express image of his person, who bears his glory, who is God in nature and being. It was quite breathtaking to hear Simon Peter exclaim such words. And then there's the response of Jesus to all of that. And you notice what Jesus says to him in verse 17. Well, he says, Simon, son of John, how blessed you are. You really need to grasp this. Jesus is looking upon the man and saying to him, Simon, he says, you have been blessed by God above all people. We use that phrase ourselves, of course, my, I have been blessed, we say. We usually speak about some fairly trivial thing when we are saying it. We say, well, I've been blessed by God in this or that or the other. But Jesus never anywhere else in the New Testament pronounces an individual as blessed. He speaks in the Beatitudes of many people who will be blessed if they live this way. But he comes to Simon and he says, Oh, God has poured his blessing upon you, Simon. You are the man above all men in the world to be congratulated and envied on this day. That's the meaning of the word makarios. You are a man whose life is blessed, honored by God in such a way that all other men ought to say, would to God that I were like Simon just now. So the dawning of that light on Simon Peter brings from the lips of Jesus this extraordinary reaction. What a, what a thing to happen to you, Simon, he says. What a thing to happen to you. Can you grasp how we get overwhelmed with excitement if somebody dear and near to us has something altogether wonderful that has happened to them? Well, that's Jesus' language. Blessed art thou, Simon, he says. And then he tells him why. He says, you know, Simon, this is not just the result of an emotional outburst. Nor is it the result of profound theological perception. Nor is it the result of much discussion and thinking. What has happened to you? And this is why you are blessed by my Father. What has happened to you is that your blind eyes have been opened. And you have been made to see by my Father in heaven... That's the explanation of how you know what you have just proclaimed. And I want to say to you that that's the only way that we ever find ourselves thinking aright about Jesus Christ and share Simon Peter's confession. See, the reason, my dear friends, the reason that people are vague about Jesus is the reason that people whose sight is almost gone are vague about everything. You know, my mother had a very serious cataract with complications many years before she died. And she used to go around the house. Everything was vague. She stumbled into things. She wouldn't believe something was there. If she couldn't see it, she sometimes poured the tea into an imaginary cup on the table with disastrous consequences. She couldn't see. She, the world was vague around her. I know many people who come to me, and when we are talking about God and speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, they say to me, I don't see that. I don't see it. 
I just don't see that that way. And of course that's true. That's precisely the problem, in fact. Until God in His grace takes the scales off your eyes as an ophthalmic surgeon did with my mother. And suddenly she said, Oh, I see. Have you seen all the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ yet? If not, you need to plead with God that He'll do the same for you as He did for Simon. And then He said to them, to him, I tell you, He said, verse 18, you are Peter. Now, don't miss that, because you will remember that in John's gospel at the beginning, Jesus had looked at Simon when he met him first of all and said, You're Simon, he said. I tell you, though, something. I have got plans for you, young man. You're going to be Peter one day, a rock. And here, Jesus says to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, he says, I have plans for you, Peter, who once was Simon. And I'm going to build the church of Jesus Christ in the world, and on such a believer and such a leader as you, I plan to build this company of my people. I have a destiny for you, Simon, he said. And in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, if you go on reading, you will find how Simon Peter was the great leader who went out and multitudes, 3,000 on the first day, were brought to faith in Jesus Christ. And Simon Peter became the leader of that great company of God's people. And then with the rest of the apostles, he became the foundation of the church. Very obviously, do I need to point it out to you? Jesus is not saying to Simon Peter as an ordinary, poor, redeemed sinner that he's going to make him the one person on whom the whole church will rest in perpetuity. Because just a few sentences later, he is saying to him, Get behind me, Satan. You savor not of the things that belong to God, but the things that belong to man. But he has a destiny for this man, Simon Peter. And that destiny is to be gloriously used by the Lord Jesus Christ in the upbuilding of his kingdom. Oh, how wonderful when the living God comes down and touches you in a world where people are looking so desperately for significance and says, I have a destiny for you. I mean to use you in a way that the world would never have believed. But it all begins with this matter of clarity. And I need to ask you as we close this morning, are you still in the world of vagueness about Jesus? Have you allowed God really to confront you with Him, the Son of the living God who came to be prophet, priest, and king? So that you may bow down before Him and say with Thomas, you are my Lord, and you are my God, and there's nothing in the world that could be more wonderful for me than to be your servant. Let's pray together.
Our Heavenly Father, we bless you for your holy word. We thank you above all for him who came from heaven's glory to reveal your glory to us, and by his death on the cross to bear our sin, and by his resurrection to bring us everlasting life. We pray that you would speak to us and open our eyes that we may see Jesus for his name's sake. Amen.